Hello, thank you for tuning in to today's presentation. My name is Tyler Genders and I'm a wildlife disease biologist and feral swine coordinator for USDA Wildlife Services. And today we're gonna to be talking about feral swine. In this presentation, we will be discussing five main topics. The first, what are feral swine? The second, why do we care about feral swine? Are they hurting anything? We'll take a look at the history of Ohio's feral swine program. We'll also be looking at what USDA Wildlife Services is doing to combat this highly invasive species. And the last thing, we'll look at potbelly pigs on the landscape and in urban environments. So what are feral swine? This definition can change from state to state, but Ohio Administrative Code says feral swine means any swine that has lived any part of its life free roaming. As cut and dry as this definition may seem, it still leaves some gray areas with certain types of pigs, whether it's domestic escaped or pot pigs. So what do Ohio feral swine pigs actually look like? The majority of the general public don't even know that Ohio actually has feral swine. So do we have pigs that look like the southern half of the United States that have spots, stripes, and are multicolored? Do we have pigs that are more of that Russian Eurasian type style? Well, in the typical 90% of our pigs that we find in Ohio have that Russian Eurasian type look. As in this picture, you can see the dark fur tones, that long kind of straight tail with a lot of fur on the end, that really elongated snout, and that really, really stocky build. This is the typical pig we find. We have found in the past though, several types of pigs, whether they're kind of reddish color or even stri striped pigs. And then we deal with domestic escapes, which you know can vary from all sorts of different types of styles, colors, body sizes. But in general, this is the type of pig we'll be dealing with. This daylight image provides a good example of the characteristics I just described in the previous slide. You can see the straight tail and the pig in the center, and you can see the really elongated snout and the pig in the right. Now, all three of these pigs have the long guard hairs and are very dark and featured, other than the odd characteristic, like I mentioned previously, of the kind of reddish pig in the back, which we typically do not see, but is a good representation overall of the pigs we deal with on the landscape. Now, compared to the feral swine, typically domestic swine are gonna have drastically different characteristics. This one has a longer, slender body. You can't really see it in the back, but has a curly tail, not typical of feral swine or Russian Eurasian characteristics, and has notched ears for identification and more of a shorter snout, kind of a little bit flatter in the head. In the next slide, you'll see a better comparison between the two. Now, this is a really good example, extreme example, but a good example to see the difference between typical domestic swine and the Russian Eurasian feral swine. Now, you look at the one on the left, the big curvature in the forehead, which is super flat, all the way to a shortened snout, as compared to the feral swine, which is elongated and straight from the back of the cranium all the way to the tip of the nose. And you'll typically see a little bit of variation in both of, this, both of these, depending on the breed of the domestic swine and or the crossbreeding of domestic swine and feral swine. And we'll get a little bit of variation, but this is basically what we're gonna be seeing. All swine have very similar hoof characteristics. You can see the pad on the hoof is connected in the back and the overall shape creates a round, almost circular track. As compared to deer, which is most commonly confused with, deer have a more elongated track that comes to a more abrupt or sharp point and then also no connection in the pad in the back. Now we've talked a lot about different characteristics of swine and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. A pig is a pig is a pig. Whether it's domestic escape, domestics, Eurasian boar, hybrid crosses, and even pot belly pigs, they're all from the same family. Now that we have an understanding of what feral swine are, why do we care? Why do we care that they're running rampant through most of the US? Are they doing anything? hurting anything? These next several slides, we'll be discussing just that. To understand the problems of feral swine, we first need to look at their reproduction. 
Now, typically in the wild, feral swine reach sexual maturity about six months of age, or in the top right picture, a little bit earlier than that. Gestation is three months, three weeks, and three days. And typically in Ohio, we're seeing about two litters per year. On average, each litter produces about three to six piglets, and in some cases, we've seen as many as 12. Now, this is such a concern because in Ohio, feral swine have no natural predators. It allows the population to grow exponentially and compete with native species for natural resources. So now that we understand how a pig reproduces and we understand they reproduce a lot, we need to look at exactly what a pig does. And the first thing we're gonna take a look at is wallowing. Wallowing is done because swine cannot naturally produce sweat to cool their bodies off. And so what they need is they need a seat, a wet area, a creek, shallow creek, or a river bank where they can apply mud to their bodies to reduce their body temperatures at hot summer days. Well, what this in turn does is it creates erosion, as in this picture on the side of a hill. It can erode creek banks, river banks, destroy riparian areas, but also can act as a disease vector or a possible disease transmission area for other native species and livestock. Once swine are done walling, they then create these things called mud rubs, and it's exactly as the name sounds. They usually go to small trees, sometimes medium to large trees, in close proximity to the wallows, and they do this for two reasons. They're rubbing their body down to remove large clumps of mud and hopefully to remove parasites off their bodies, and they also do this for marking their territory. Now this has the potential for root exposure, removal of bark, and that stress does and can kill those trees. Now if you look at the left two pictures, you're probably thinking someone just took a rototiller and tore up these guys' yards. Well, in fact, it's what I would consider to be the staple of feral swine damage, and that is rooting. And that's when these pigs are taking their elongated snouts and pushing, moving, and flipping dirt to forage, or possibly even dig deeper to find wet areas to wallow in. And if you look at all three pictures, you can see just how extensive this damage can be. And it can create erosion problems, it can create contamination, disease vector possibilities, or just do general property damage where these landowners have to consistently try to repair this just to maintain basic living. And feral swine, if not removed from the landscape, can continue to do this again and again and again. This slide is a very good representation of just how extensive this rooting damage can be. And in this particular case, these pigs actually dug 21 inches deep. And you can see that this particular area is kind of a hayfield mixture, but actually it's a power line right away. And if you're talking about digging 21 inches deep, you have the possibility to affect, you know, these power line or these infrastructures that are along these ways where these pigs are doing this extensive amount of damage. Feral swine also do an extensive amount of damage to crop fields. Now the particular crop targeted varies from where you're at in the US, whether it's a peanut field in Georgia or in this particular case, the crop field in Southern Ohio. There's a lot going on in this particular slide. And the main takeaway is that feral swine or swine in general have the potential to carry up to 30 different types of diseases and 37 different types of parasites that can affect pets, livestock, and even people. And we're focusing on sampling for mainly three of them, swine brucellosis, classical swine fever, and pseudo rabies. And we've also worked with organizations and universities to collect other samples if they're looking for something for a particular study. Now this slide may seem completely harmless. Just a couple pigs, hanging out with a cow, nothing to see here. But what it's really showing is that feral swine do have the ability to come in contact with livestock. And if diseases were to be transmitted and a herd tested positive, it could have detrimental impact on the livestock industry and US trade around the world. Overall, this highly invasive species has the potential to be detrimental to agricultural industries, livestock industries, compete and push out native species, and transmit diseases to 
livestock, wildlife, pets, and even people if they're not removed from the landscape. Feral swine as a whole do $1.5 billion worth of damage each and every year in the United States. Before we discuss how we are combating feral swine, we first will look at the history of the Ohio Feral Swine Program. In the beginning, only disease surveillance was being conducted, looking for swine brucellosis, classical swine fever, and pseudorabies. It wasn't until the following year where we first began removing feral swine with the help from landowners and responsible conservationists. In 2014, the Ohio Feral Swine Elimination Program began with the initiation of the National Feral Swine Program. And today, we have one wildlife disease biologist and six feral swine technicians combating feral swine all throughout the state. We now are taking a look at our current Ohio feral swine population map. The current populations we have in blue are covering roughly nine counties, with the largest population being in Vinton County. In the eastern part of the state are our feral swine elimination cells. These cells were created before the initiation of the Ohio feral swine elimination program. These reports were neither confirmed or denied to have feral swine and currently are being investigated. We've been able to remove one feral swine elimination cell already in Morgan County and hope to have these removed within the next two years. Now that we have an understanding of the history of the higher feral swine program and where these feral swine populations are located, we're going to be talking about combating feral swine. Feral swine are extremely elusive, nocturnal animals that have the ability to move six miles in a single night. We've also recognized that these animals are seasonally moving where food availability is most abundant, making them extremely difficult to locate and remove off the landscape. We have found the best method for removing feral swine to be the use of the large corral traps. These corral traps have eight foot wide gates that are then linked to the cellular camera in the picture on the right hand side. That cellular camera then has the ability to send us text messages to our cell phones. Once the camera sends the photos to our cell phones, we then have the ability to view the trap in real time. This is done for several reasons as the previous methods with a trip trigger were set off every single time by anything, whether it was a deer or a single pig, educating any pigs that weren't inside the trap. This camera and this system allows us to send text message and communicate with that camera to whether to drop the trap or not drop the trap 365 days a year. As I mentioned, we have the ability not to drop the trap now with this system. Whether it's domestic dogs, white-tailed deer, or even cattle getting in the trap, we can avoid unnecessary trap and stress on these animals with this particular system. This slide provides a series of photos showing the trapping sequence using this remote trigger system. The first photo in the top left-hand corner shows that pigs are starting to enter the trap, but there are still a few on the outside. The next photo in the top right shows that majority of the pigs are in the trap, but still one is right at the gate threshold. The bottom left photo shows that finally all pigs are within the trap and we can again then send the command to trigger the gate. Once the gate is dropped, even within two minutes, the pigs are already back to feeding. Like we mentioned previously, this has been the most effective method for removing feral swine for Ohio program. Now we're going to transition over to pot-bellied pigs. Now this has been a growing topic of concern as we get more and more of these cases, and it's a super gray area. You know, at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about the definition of feral swine, and you know, pigs walking down the street or pigs in the middle of a pasture, they're outside of captivity, and technically they're classified as feral swine. But dealing with that, we need to understand what exactly we can do to help find people that have maybe have a lost pet or you know what do you do when you're walking down the city streets of Columbus and you come across a pot-bellied pig running down the street 
we're going to talk a little bit about all that and uh, and how we're doing everything we can to make sure we're doing the right things when dealing with potbelly pigs. I first want to talk about potbelly pigs and more of the rural environment. Now these pigs end up out and about in two two relatively ways each time. Um, either one is the landowner down the road who had either poor fencing or the fence broke and the pigs wandered off. The second is people intentionally releasing the pigs because they can no longer handle them. And we're seeing some of that and what it is is a lot of times people buy a potbelly pig thinking it's going to be a miniature pig or something they can handle and even an urban environment. And it turns out that's not the case and they can't handle them anymore so they release them. But either case, we find that these pigs can still do and conduct serious damage. We've had, we've seen it before in agricultural fields doing crop damage or in pasture fields like in these photos. These pigs have the ability to root, do damage. They could cause damage to the cattle, whether they break the leg in the rooting or cause other serious issues. But the main thing is we have to deal with these still. They still have to be treated in some manner or the solution has to be found. And we work with it's a multitude of stakeholders, how Department of Agriculture, how Division of Wildlife, and local law enforcement to come up with the best method to handle these pigs, whether it's getting them back to the landowner, making sure their fences are in compliance and working and sound, or whether it's actually having to remove these pigs out the landscape because they truly have become a feral population that's roaming around. So dealing with potbelly pigs in an urban environment. And like I said in the situation before, we want to make sure we're handling these situations in the proper manner. A lot of the times you see or you hear about the success stories of Susie Q getting a potbelly pig back and everyone's all smiles. Well, that definitely could be the case. And a lot of times in urban environments, you see where pigs or these potbelly pigs escape from a landowner or in a backyard that's meant for a dog or in a rooted out. Whatever the case may be, you know, you could also have potential releases. But I always recommend no matter what animal you're dealing with or if you come across, don't try to capture it or handle it. Even if it no, may, it may seem friendly, there's still potential dangers. You know, you might come across a pig that may be a little more aggressive. Always call the local authorities and we can go down the proper chain of command and handle the situation the best way we see fit, whether it's getting it back to the landowner or getting it back to the possible, you know, humane society to be rehomed. Either way, stay safe and don't handle any of these pigs. Call the local authorities. I want to thank you guys for listening in on this presentation. It's been a pleasure. I hope you gained some knowledge from it. And please save all your questions. I know we have a Q&A at the end of the conference. So please write down all your questions and I'll be available to talk about anything you want. If you need any help or assistance, you can always call our state office at 614-993-3444.